Today we are finishing up our series looking at the life of David and this series called Human, looking at what it means to be human. And today we're going to be in the book of Psalms chapter 18. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and turn to the book of Psalms chapter 18. And uh, man, I hope, uh, there's, hear me, there's nothing wrong, absolutely nothing wrong with using your phone or iPad. But man, I would encourage you to, uh, to use a, a paper copy of God's Word. There's one in the chair in the pew in front of you. And uh, use that if you need to. Man, it's, it's fun and to just be a little more focused and dig into God's Word. Because we take the Bible really, really seriously here. We don't take ourselves too serious, but we take the Bible really, really serious. Psalms chapter 18. Now, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this or not, but I'm just going to go for it. If you don't have like a Bible, like a paper copy, that Bible in the pew in front of you, you can take home, all right? I can get in trouble later, but uh, that can be yours. We'd love for you to have that. I remember the last time I, or one of the last moments I got to be with my papa, my mom's dad, Dudley was his name, grew up in Thomasville, Georgia, but it was Christmas season, um, and he had, he had cancer. So we knew, and it was progressing, we knew it, it wouldn't be too long with my papa. And I loved my papa. He, he certainly taught me how to laugh, uh, taught me how to dance like no one's watching, taught me how to flirt with my wife at any age. <laughs> I remember even in his 80s, he would, he would flirt with my Mimi, who's still alive, he would flirt with her and she would just kind of look at him and shake her head, Dudley, <laughs> like, but always having fun. He was an incredible leader. Man, loved that man. But I remember it was Christmas, like I said, and the worship minister from the church that I'd grown up at had brought his family over. They had several kids and brought his family over and they wanted to sing some Christmas carols for my papa. And so we all sat around the living room and they just sang Christmas carols. My papa sat in a recliner. And after every song, he'd just clap for him. Just sweet, sweet moment. One of the, it's a precious memory. You know, when you know it's a last of something or one of the last, you lean in a little differently, don't you? When it's, when it's something's coming to an end, it, it, should stir your affection to lean in a little bit. As we are really looking at the end of the life of David, I'm going to show you some connections here in a minute, but as we look at the end of the life of David, it should cause us to lean in a little bit at this really central figure in the Bible. I want you to imagine for a, morning, for a moment that you're sitting at a coffee table or the breakfast table with David, and he's in his last days, what would he say to you? This mighty man of God, this man for God's own heart, who we saw last week, is certainly flawed, was certainly flawed. He was a sinner, but he was a mighty man of God. What would he say to you? What, what would he point out to you? Hey, the good news is, because we have the Bible, you don't have to guess. <laughs> You don't have to wonder, what would David say? No, we, we know some things he would say. The reason I have us in Psalm chapter 18 is, Psalms 18 is really an adaptation of 2 Samuel 22. So 2 Samuel 22, you're welcome to read that later or put your finger in there and, and mark your spot now. But 2 Samuel 22 uh, is uh, David's song of victory. And I believe it's included at the very end of his life because it's, it's representative of, the over, of an overarching theme theme of David's life, that God is good to his children. He takes care of us. So Psalm 18, while 2 Samuel 22 is very specific and particular to David, Psalm 18 is a little more generalized for the people of God as a whole, that God is good to his children. So that's why we're in Psalms 18 today, because of the connection to 2 Samuel 22. And what's really clear in this chapter is that David, as messed up as he was, he had a clear and appropriate and proper view of who God is. David knew God. So as we lean in this morning to sit and talk with David, like he's going to teach us about who God is. And hey, listen, if that doesn't seem particularly relevant to you this morning, your understanding of who God is 
affects everything about you. The great A.W. Tozer said it this way. He said, what comes into your mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you. J.I. Packer in the book Knowing God said, knowing about God is crucially important for the living of our lives. As it would be cruel to an Amazonian tribesman to fly him to London, put him down without explanation and leave him as one who knew nothing of English or England to fend for himself. So we are cruel to ourselves if we try to live in this world without knowing about the God whose world it is and who runs it. The world becomes a strange, mad, painful place and life in it a disappointing and unpleasant business for those who do not know about God. Disregard the study of God and you sentence yourself to stumble and blunder through life blindfolded, as it were, with no sense of direction and no understanding of what surrounds you. This way you can waste your life and lose your soul. What you know about God matters. We're going to this morning just drill down into one single verse in chapter 18, verse 30. What does David want us to know about God? Chapter 18, verse 30. He says, God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is pure. He is a shield to all who take refuge in him. So, so many things in this chapter David tells us about God. We're just going to see three from one verse. Here's the first right from the text because you don't need my ideas. You need God's ideas in the Bible. Number one, his way is perfect. God's way is perfect. Perfect. So let's think about this. Just even look at the text. Not my ways. His ways are perfect. You can make your plans. You can make your agenda. They're going to be imperfect. His his plan, his path, his purpose for your life is, it says, perfect. Not maybe, not sometimes, not occasionally. No, all the time, it is perfect. Perfect. It's a fact you can hang your hat on. Not not just when God's in a good mood, not when he's done a lot of planning. No, God's ways for your life, his plans, his purposes, his path are always perfect. In every season, in every moment. That word perfect is tamim, which means without, like literally, without defect. Without, kind of interesting word. Without handicap. Hmm. Friend, everything that touches your life on the path God has you, every to use, like, to stick as closely to the original as I can, every defect, every handicap, every struggle, all of it has been filtered through the sovereign hands of God and his plan for you, his path for you is perfect. You don't always see it in the moment, right? There are times where God takes you on a turn and you go, whoa, the Lord took that turn a little fast. (laughs) Or didn't see that one coming. Everything that touches your life has been filtered, sifted through the good hands of God. You know who could attest to that? Is Joseph. Do you remember in Genesis, the story of Joseph? From the beginning of his life, God really kind of showed him a little bit like, hey, this is what your path is going to be like. This is the plan I have for you. But it seemed like for the first several, as we read, the first few chapters that, that we read of Joseph's life, the plan didn't seem to be going so well. Brothers sold him into slavery. Thought about killing him. Like, like, you know, instead of killing him, let's throw him into slavery. Can you imagine your siblings having that conversation about your life? It's terrifying. Then he, God sees him, and, or never, never quit seeing him, but 
He rises to some influence in Potiphar's household. He does the right thing, and yet he ends up in a dungeon again. And then he even tells the helpers of the king, the pharaoh, hey, hey, here's what God is saying to you, and they still overlook him. Time after time, turn after turn, it seems like his path was broken. But do you remember if you fast forward in the book of Genesis, God uses, he used Joseph to provide food to the world in the middle of a famine. And then when, brother, when Joseph's brothers are standing there cowering before him, begging for mercy, crying, Joseph tells them what you meant for evil, what? God meant for good. Not, not, and not just, not just used, but meant for good. All of those hard turns in Joseph's life, all those moments that we look at and go, that doesn't seem perfect. That seems like a defect. That seems like a handicap. That's going to set him back. God used all of those to bring about his perfect plan. His ways are perfect. So you know what you do with that? You trust. In whatever season you're in, whatever hardship, whatever joy, whatever difficulty, whatever blessing, you trust that God, his way is perfect. He knows what he is doing. Psalm 23 that David wrote, he's the good shepherd that is leading you, right? Psalm 139, all the days of your life were written in his book before you were even born. His plan, his way is perfect. And you say, well, Brandon, like, okay, I hear that, but I'm reading my life right now and I don't like the story that's being written. I would challenge you, I would encourage you to wait for God to keep writing your story. Well, he's already written it, but wait for, in a sense, for God to turn the page and you to see what's next. I would be willing to bet that Joseph in those moments, in those hardships, was, he had his own questions, but God was still working his plan. Think about David, do you know, I, I didn't look up uh, this, uh, this week, but thinking back when I've said this before, David, from the time he was anointed to the time he actually functionally was the king, I think it was 16 or 17 chapters. That's a long time. That's a really long time. To, hey, David, you're the man. God's got you. This is going to be great. And then 16, 17 chapters later, finally, you don't know how long God's plan is going to take. But trust his way is perfect. And how, how can you trust and know that his way is perfect? Because his word tells us that. And the second thing we see, second point in this text is his word is pure. <laughs> so I can trust that God's plan for me, his way for me, his purpose for me is perfect because his word is pure. Some translations say, for pure, they say proven, tried, true, without blemish. It, there's, there's no part of God's word that is not pure and trustworthy and proven time and time and time again. You can trust his word. It's pure. Do you notice there, at least the CSB, probably most translations have this, where it says the word of the Lord is pure. Do you notice that? The entire word Lord, L-O-R-D, all the letters are capitalized, but the L is a little bigger, and then O-R-D, they're capitalized, they're just a little bit smaller. That is the English way of showing us what is in Hebrew. This is the word Yahweh, God's covenant-keeping name. So let's think about that in context. The word of the Lord is pure. The covenant-keeping God who is faithful to his promises, faithful in his mercy, faithful in his kesed, his loving kindness, that faithful God, his war, word is pure, tried and true and trustworthy. You can trust every bit of it. The word of the Lord is pure. David leans in this morning and wants you to know you can take God at his word. When I was here, when Lauren and I were back here back in July and we had the, the luncheon afterwards in the gym, which man... I've already determined, I just, just give it a little time. I'm pretty sure I'm going to put on some weight being the pastor, the campus pastor here at uh, Harvest Heights. But I remember before we went over there, somebody, I can't remember who it was, maybe even the night before, said, 
By the way, I got permission to share this uh, from Miss Emma, but someone told me, I think it might have been Michael uh, Foster said, man, whatever you do, you've got to get some of Miss Emma's dessert. Whatever she, yes, hallelujah. <laughs> whatever Miss Emma makes, you've got to get you some. And so, of course, in the, in the hustle and bustle of meeting everybody, I, that wasn't on my radar in the moment. And I remember, uh, I can't remember who it was, maybe Miss Mona, that, that, not really sure, it doesn't matter, but someone brought me up this little tiny dessert plate and whatever it was, it looked like they had just scraped the pan of what Miss Emma had made. And it was a, it was a coconut cream cake. She corrected me, it was not a pie, it was a cake. She, she sent me straight there. But if I'm honest, I already told her this, but if I'm honest, when I saw the plate, I thought, I might have picked something different. <laughs> It just didn't look that good to me because it really was like they had just scraped maybe the leftovers. Maybe they went to some of your plates and got some of your coconut cake. Like there was not much left. And, and typically I'm not a big coconut cream guy. Like I just, again, probably wouldn't have been my first choice. So we eat the barbecue and everything was so good. And it comes time for dessert. I remember I took one bite and put my fork down. It was like, God is good. <laughs> you, could, you could ask my wife, like, we got back to Lubbock because uh, we were there for a month or so after that. And for probably two weeks, occasionally I would just go, man, do you remember that coconut cream cake? It was so good. Every little scrap that I had, why did I tell you that? There is no bite of God's word that is not pure and trustworthy and good. And listen, there's times you're going to be reading the Bible and you're like, oh, that does not make sense. It, it won't look good to you, but I promise his word is good. It is without blemish. So even in the morning, if you've only got a few minutes to put together some, quote, scraps and real quick read the Bible, it's worth it because his word is good. And because it's good and proven and tried and true and trustworthy and you know it's good, you can build your life on the word of God. Just for clarity, we believe, I'm saying we, I'm going to go ahead and say that. <laughs> I'm new here, but I'm going to say we. We believe this is God's inerrant, inspired, perfect, holy word from cover to cover. So we're going to read it. We're going to preach it. We're going to live it. We're going to build our lives on it. What did Jesus say at the end of the Sermon on the Mount? The wise person is the person who does what he said. Not just listen, think about the book of James. He addressed that too, James' brother, Jesus' half-brother. James said, hey, don't just be a hearer, be a doer. Where did he get that from? He got that from his older brother, Jesus, who said, don't just hear my words, do them. Because they're good, they're trustworthy, they're tried, they're true, they're proven. You can build your life on the word of God because his word is pure. His way is perfect. His word is pure. Number three, his provision is enough. His provision is enough. Look at the last little part of verse 30. He is a shield to all who take refuge in him. David, from a military perspective and from a metaphorical perspective, so to speak, had found refuge in the Lord. That the Lord was a shield for him. He could run to him and, and find rest and, and find protection, find nourishment in the Lord. If you look at all of Psalms 18 over and over again, that's one of the overarching themes that God provided for David. His provision is enough. It's not, when you read the Psalms, when you read David's life, it's not God plus something. No, it's God is enough. Look, I mean, just, I know I said one verse, but just to steal from verse 31 for a second, he says, For who is God besides the Lord? And who is a rock? Only our God. He's the only rock. You can build your life on him and what he provides for you, his foundation, his provision is enough. Think about David and Goliath. When David ran out to fight Goliath, he didn't tell Goliath, hey, you know, Goliath, I've been working out. I've been doing some CrossFit. I think I can take you. <laughs> they told Goliath, the battle belongs to who? Belongs to the Lord. So you're not coming against me, Goliath. You're coming against the Lord. Goliath brought a knife to a gunfight because he wasn't fighting David. He was fighting the Lord. 
and the Lord would provide what David needed. The Lord's provision is enough. In every area of your life, you don't always see it, you're not always aware of it, but it's enough. As a quick side note, I want to encourage you maybe this afternoon or later this week, read through 2 Samuel 22, read through Psalm 18 and consider the goodness and grace of God in your life. That's what David did. He was aware of God's goodness, his provision. You know, we could, we, me included, could get, could get better at that, being aware of God's goodness. Uh, our, our kids are, are super grateful. You guys are awesome. You really are. But like average kids, or every kid, uh, sometimes they're just not aware of what parents do for them, right? This past, uh, this summer, we went to San Antonio for a little vacation. And one of the days we went to SeaWorld when it was 120 degrees, probably not, but literally it was 108 that day. So it probably felt like 120 on the asphalt. But I remember I stayed up the night before. We, we, uh, that was like day five of vacation. And stayed up the night before we went to SeaWorld. I downloaded the SeaWorld app. I, planned, I looked at all the shows <clears throat> and the distances to different things. I knew the, the animals, they would, the sea creatures they would want to see. I made a plan. I was in full-out dad mode, right? <laughs> we get there that day, and then they had a great time. They were grateful. But as we were walking from show to show and sweat pouring down our faces, spending $20 for a, water, a bottle of water, <laughs> it just, I was kind of laughing at how uh, as grateful as they were, as awesome as they were, how, how just as a five-year-old, just how oblivious they were to all Laura and I had done to make that trip happen, right? Like to all we'd done to provide for them. And maybe it's because I'm always in like looking for metaphors and illustrations or maybe it was just the Lord's hand. But I felt like the Lord just tapped me on the shoulder and said, hey, Brandon, like that's you with me all the time. <laughs> that I'm running around living life and most of the time, probably really oblivious to just the amazing ways God is providing for me. His provision is enough. David knew that and that's why he clung to God. When you know that his provision is enough, you rejoice in his provision. I think that's why we, earlier when we celebrated the Lord's Supper, communion, we There's a reflection, but there's also a rejoicing that the Lord provided for me. I owed a debt I could not pay, and Jesus paid it all. You know, even David knew he needed a Savior. That's why he he rejoiced in the Lord and and threw his life in dependence on the Lord. If, If you read, you finish Samuel 22 and on, 23, and then on into 1 Kings. We see in 1 Kings chapter 2, David is kind of almost um, boring, normal, ordinary. David, just like you will, just like I will, David died. He died. The king of Israel, the greatest king they ever had, he died. No matter your stature, no matter how impressive and important your resume is, no matter your stature, you need a Savior. And that Savior is Jesus Christ. If you want to look to David, man, he was awesome. I want to be like him. David will lean in and tell you, look to Jesus. You need a Savior. Jesus is the true and better David. I'm going to ask our worship team to, to come on up. And I want, to, I want to close with this thought. Because this is the word of God. <clears throat> as we looked at just that one verse this morning. God, his way is perfect. His word is, the Lord, his word is pure. He's a refuge. That's not just David leaning in to tell you, here's what you need to know about God. These are some some truths you can cling to. That's God leaning in and telling you, this is who I am. Think about that. As we we studied the the Bible this morning, it's like you're sitting there at the the coffee table, the breakfast table, wherever, and God's leaning in. I want you to know. He's telling you, if you're his child, if you've been saved by grace through faith, he's telling you, 
My way is perfect. My word is pure. And I'm a refuge. I'm going to provide for you. Provided salvation, you can trust me. I'll provide for you. So I want to ask you, what is your response to that this morning? Which one of those, maybe it's all of them, but which one of those truths is the Lord inviting you to really latch on to and cling to this morning? Is there a way in which God is leading you in a path he's got you on that you just need to, I'm going to trust you. Talk to him about it. Do you need to begin to build your life on his word, knowing that it's pure? You can, you can trust it. It's proven. So you can build your life on it. In what way is he calling you to live out his word? And in what way is he calling you to rest in his provision? To rejoice in his provision for you? If you've not taken refuge in him for salvation, he invites you with arms open wide, with nail-scarred hands to come to his saving arms. How is he calling you to respond this morning? We give you just a brief moment to be still before the Lord, and then we're going to sing in a time of response.